my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rando Alakmitz. Uh, just a little bit about his background. He earned his BA and his MS at Moscow State University. He earned his PhD at the Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry in Moscow. He completed fellowships at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, and at NIH in Maryland. Uh, he has published over 60 papers and projects, and probably way more than I could ever count, on uh, photoreceptor genetics, macular retinal, and cancer genetics. He is currently the research director and Acavella professor at Columbia University, as well as the, a professor of ophthalmology and pathology and cell biology at Columbia University. Uh, so let's welcome Dr. Alec Metz. Thank you very much. Uh, as you heard, I've been around the block a few times, spending time in Russia for 10 years, where I got my practice in uh, vodka drinking. Um, <laughs> but today I'm doing a few firsts. I've never given a clinical talk because I'm a geneticist. I'm not an MD. I'm a PhD. So be patient and nice with me because this is an area that I really I'm learning, but I don't know that much about. Uh, at noon, I'll be talking more about genetics that I know a little bit better. So the Stargardt disease and ABCA4 gene was the reason I am in uh, eye genetics and I am at uh, Columbia uh, Harkness Eye Institute. Before that, I was doing cancer genetics mostly and worked at the uh, National Cancer Institute here in, in the States. Um, and I was working on ATP binding cassette transporters that are involved in uh, many different diseases. The most prominent and well-known is cystic fibrosis, uh, for example. And uh, these proteins are also multidrug resistance pumps that uh, kind of oppose uh, uh, chemotherapy, so they pump drugs out of the cells. However, one of the members of the superfamily named ABCA4 uh, was the one that is causing Stargardt disease and many other phenotypes that I will show today, and that brought me into eye genetics, where we have had quite a bit of fun in uh, both early onset Mendelian retinal diseases and with uh, Greg Hegeman here in uh, age-related macular degeneration that I will not talk about today at all. Um, so the, every good work takes a good team. And um, my team is usually quite small. Here, what I'm talking about today is mainly done by uh, Winston, who is my study coordinator. But I bet it's the best study coordinator ever because he does everything. He not only coordinates the study, he does imaging, he analyz analyzes imaging, he writes papers. So he does may, way more than he's supposed to. Jana has been in my lab for many years. She does most of the genetic studies on ABC4 and the whole exome sequencing that we've done the last five years or so were done by Angela, who just uh, got her PhD and uh, left the lab. So here are some other people. Again, here is Winston, but there is also Caleb and uh, Tobias who did a lot of this work I'll be talking about today, and mostly on imaging of uh, different uh, retinal disease patients. So Stargardt disease, as any retinal specialist know, it is the most frequent Mendelian uh, retinal disease. Uh, it has mostly juvenile onset, but you'll see uh, during this talk and uh, later today, that it really spans the entire spectrum of um, age. Uh, it is characterized by a loss of central vision. Usually you have macular atrophy as uh, one of the first signs. Uh, it has some characteristic flecks in macular region on the periphery that are made of uh, lipofusin, and we'll talk about that also. And for me and for geneticists, Especially it, what uh, is the main cause of the disease, what is the cause of the disease. You have to have two mutations in ABC4 gene. What is the transporter of vitamin A derivatives in the visual cycle? Yeah? So it has very specialized function. 
and um, uh, is expressed only in rod and cone photoreceptors. There is some discussion that it may be expressed also in RPE, but we haven't really uh, verified that. Uh, so this slide is borrowed from Chris Polchewski. Actually, Utah in 2000 was the place where I met Chris first. He's at Case Western. He has done a lot of biochemical studies, as you know, on visual cycle, and he also was trying to do the structure of the ABCA4 gene. Um, it's a large transmembrane protein. The structure didn't come out that great, and we're still waiting for a better one. But it is, this slide shows it's located in uh, the raw outer segment disc uh, rims, because it's a big protein. It can't be in the disc itself. It's on the rims. And this is kind of a schematic structure of it. It has two nucleotide binding domains that use ATP <coughs> as energy for transport. And it has also uh, several transmembrane segments. Uh, the function of it, as I mentioned, it's a transporter of 11 cis and all transretinal in the visual cycle. This slide is borrowed from uh, Bob Molde, who has done probably the most in terms of figuring out ABC for a function. And it shows this is the, how the visual cycle works. And ABC4 is in the rim, making sure that the, uh, at first it was thought that it works only with the light and it transports all transretinal out of the membrane. But it also has been shown that it uh, transports 11 cis. So it keeps the balance of uh, 11 cis and all trans in uh, the correct balance in the uh, discs of photoreceptors. And if the balance is disturbed, you'll see you get into the disease and you start accumulating those bisretinoids. The most famous is A2E, where, uh, which are uh, phototoxic and are either a cause of the disease. Uh, now um, they uh, say that maybe they are not the single cause of the disease, but these are the greatest marker uh, of the disease and probably a cause in uh, many mm, cases. So this slide was made, yeah, that uh, when we were talking about therapeutic applications, I will not uh, discuss those uh, today, but there are many ways and many stages in the visual cycle you can really intervene if you have mutations in ABC4 to try to alleviate mm, the issues, and several of them are in clinical trials or close. The gene therapy we did um, at Columbia is in clinical trials right now. The chemical modification of uh, A2E is in clinical trials. And some others are, have been uh, proposed but not yet uh, made it to clinical trials. So the uh, main way we image patients uh, is the short wave autofluorescence. And uh, this is slide, again, from Janet Sparrow's work. She is the, has done the most in terms of figuring out the bisretinoid A2E I already mentioned. And uh, it can be uh, really shown that the mm, A2E accumulates at very high levels in Stargard patients, in mouse models, the knockout uh, mouse, and uh, so on and so forth. So it is a marker that is greatly visualized. And now what we do at Columbia, we also quantify it. So we modify the autofluorescence imaging by adding a reference bar so we can precisely quantify the amount of autofluorescence and give it a number of um, what it is at different stages of Stargard uh, disease. And again, here is the graph that shows that we all accumulate A2E during our lifetime, and it grows. This is the normal curve. And you can see that most of uh, ABCA4 mutated patients have way elevated lipofusin. However, there are a few that do not show that, and this is also kind of interesting side of the story, and I'll touch uh, upon that a bit. Another imaging technology we are now using is near-infrared autofluorescence as opposed to the short wavelength that measures the uh, 
lipofusin and A2E in both RPE and photoreceptor outer segments. Uh, the near-infrared signal detects the melanin in the RPE cell. They also discussed that probably melanolipofusin, however, it hasn't been very well determined, but pretty much with these two methods you can separate the RPE part from the photoreceptor part. And uh, you can uh, figure out quite a bit about the disease mechanisms. So here is the same uh, person imaged by uh, short wavelength and near infrared image. Uh, this is a uh, what is called normal. It is a undiseased uh, patient, uh, undiseased individual. So now when you do the image the same uh, patient here, we have a Stargardt patient, you can see a few things here on near infrared where there are dark dots, that means that RP is gone, so RP is dead at those uh, places. And you can see that they overlay perfectly with the flex. So when it was uh, postulated uh, before that uh, what autofluorescence images, it images A to E, lipofusin in the RPE cell, actually, I think, uh, and uh, this is what Janet Sparrow says, that most of the uh, uh, autofluorescence really comes from the photoreceptor outer segments because RPE is dead in those places where you have this uh, very intense uh, lipofusin signal. And here, from uh, one of our papers, again, you can see that um, the flex appear later, so this is the same patient first imaged with a short wavelength, near infrared, you can see that uh, there is no flex in these spots where the uh, RP has died, but it appears there later exactly at those locations, meaning that it is not in the RP cells, it is really in the uh, photoreceptors. OCT, of course, is another method that is very widely used, and we uh, use that a lot in uh, all retinal diseases and also in uh, patients with <laughs> ABC4 disease. And uh, these days, you can really have a very detailed uh, images of uh, the retina, and uh, there are several uh, discernible bands in the retina, for example, the ELM, external limiting membrane, it has several names, we call it ELM, which is very faint and narrow band in healthy uh, subjects, and there are, you know, this is an RPE band, and you can see that in uh, ABC4 disease, in Stargardt disease, uh, one of the first things you see is the uh, thickening of the ELM band. Uh, so, <clears throat> what is ELM band? It is uh, suggested of being the connections between Miller cells and between Miller cells and photoreceptors. So, the kind of suggestion that is not confirmed at this point is that this represents Miller cells fighting the uh, disease since uh, uh, Miller cells are involved, as you know, in cone visual cycle that is different from RP visual cycle and just trying to keep the uh, photoreceptors um, alive and going. Um, you, this is just the plots that this is one of the first signs of the disease and we also have uh, looked at the thickness of ISC band and then the uh, relationship of these two, and this is a very well quantifiable feature in uh, Stargardt uh, patients, in all <coughs> patients with ABC4 disease. Another interesting phenotype, subphenotype that we see is called optical gap. Um, this is uh, something that we see in many patients, but mostly in those that present with bullseye maculopathy as opposed to the classical Stargardt picture. Um, interestingly, uh, this phenotype is associated mostly with this most frequent and quite famous mutation in ABC4 1961. And it's a gradual uh, loss of 
uh, photoreceptors and cells and RPE in the macula uh, where a large gap is forming that will later collapse and you'll have the macular degeneration. So these are different stages through which a large fraction of uh, Stargard patients actually uh, move. Interestingly, again, I may have a slide about that. These patients do not accumulate much lipofusin at all. So again, it shows that the same disease is happening by uh, several different methods, and we're trying to find out specifically or, you know, what is the biology uh, behind that, why some mutations like 1961 cause a very specific phenotype that is not associated with this well-known classical uh, high level of accumulation of lipofusin. Uh, <clears throat> some other more recent methods and quite uh, fancy are in FAS uh, OCT, where you do the segmentation of the OCT image, and uh, then you can look at the same place in greater detail and also the OCT angiography where you can really uh, look at choriocapillaries uh, here in healthy you see it in the diseased uh, individual it's completely gone and you don't um, uh, see it. So this is <clears throat> in general where you talk about you know Stargardt disease it's really not that simple and not that um, uh, very uniform disease. All of these uh, autofluorescence images are from people with two mutations in ABCA4. And as you can see, clinically, it's often very, very difficult to put a uh, precise diagnosis uh, for every patient. And I always say that, and I will specifically talk about that uh, today at noon that these days you have to do uh, genetic analysis and only then you can confirm the disease because it can be from a very small um, lesion in the macula, like a bullseye, to really panretinal degeneration. And actually, we have shown that patients uh, progress very differently depending on the uh, ABCA4 mutations and some other uh, modifiers that we are trying to find out, meaning variants in other genes. Now, this is more of a classical way how Stargardt disease progresses. Uh, so, you have a juvenile onset maculopathy. Again, first it starts with a kind of a small lesion, but the flecks start developing, then they uh, spread all over, then they uh, uh, consolidate and, and really uh, once you get to this stage you have a very serious vision loss. Usually this is happening over uh, quite uh, a few uh, decades. Now, uh, as I already mentioned, this mutation that is the most frequent mutation, about 20% of patients carry uh, at least one uh, 1961 mutation is quite different because when you see these patients, you can tell they will never develop into severe disease. They are always, they will stay pretty much, I think, no, this is a, okay, let me, I'll, I'll come to that slide later. Again, this one I already showed, 1961, does not accumulate lipofusin much at all. And it stays within, you know, this kind of a clinical uh, picture. You have a loss of central vision, but you never, you don't get flex. You do not accumulate lipofusin. You will never get panretinal degeneration. And uh, age at onset <coughs> and flex distribution is also uh, kind of evenly uh, distributed between the groups. But... Uh, if there is something in terms you can tell to the patient uh, when you know the genetic basis of the disease is that if you have at least one of the two is alleles is G1961E, you can tell them quite uh, surely that this is the disease uh, progress they have and they will not have a major degeneration of the entire retina. 
Uh, many patients with mutations in ABCA4 get late onset disease as opposed to juvenile onset. Uh, age of onset can be as late as in the 60s. Uh, sometimes they are then confused with age-related macular degeneration. It has happened quite frequently. We have many patients who were diagnosed past 60 years of age and at first with AMD and by only genetic screening we figured out that this is late onset Stargardt and this is you know kind of a <clears throat> classical picture of late um, onset disease. Another thing what we see and again it makes sense late onset usually the disease onset is determined by the uh, visual uh, loss uh, these patients have foveal sparing, meaning that they have a small patch of cells right in the fovea, as clearly seen here. And although they have quite substantial degeneration, their vision is uh, sometimes 20-20, sometimes 20-30, so they do not experience significant vision loss. And a, I would say 80% of patients with late onset uh, Stargardt uh, have the foveal sparing and very uh, uh, benign or minimal vision loss. So the uh, phenotypically they look uh, similar but actually 1961 is involved in early onset disease and not uh, late onset usually. So now there are some more severe forms, uh, cone rod dystrophy. Usually these patients are uh, human knockouts <coughs> meaning they have two deleterious mutations <coughs> in ABC4 they have no functional uh, ABC4 protein. Uh, they have very early onset and they rapidly develop into uh, panretinal degeneration. Uh, again, they have major uh, lipofusin accumulation and aggressive uh, lipofusin accumulation and cone responses are diminished uh, at quite early age. Um, this is also uh, pictures from patient with ABC4 disease. Uh, if you look at this clinically, you could say that this is probably looks very much like retinitis pigmentosa, although there are several <coughs> differences uh, between the real retinitis pigmentosa uh, and uh, the one that looks like it caused by mutations in ABC4. Again, these patients are knockouts. They have no functional ABC protein, but as you can see, uh, Despite the fact that they are genetically knockouts, uh, these patients and then the cone rod dystrophy patients, their disease phenotypically is quite different, uh, which we still have to figure out why, because you would say that knockout is a knockout and you should get pretty much the same phenotype. But uh, again, uh, you have here cones dying first. So this is not like classical retinitis pigmentosis, so it's not true. And, you know, in uh, autofluorescence image, you know, in, in the fundus photo, it looks very much like bone spicule pigment. In, um, in autofluorescence, you can see that you have flex uh, and you have peripapillary sparing, so the uh, features of uh, ABCA4 disease. So this is kind of the general picture of how what we call Stargardt disease, now we call ABCA4 disease, uh, is happening in different <laughs> groups depending on the mutations that are in ABCA4 gene and uh, some people never develop into the end stages. This is kind of the what we call the critical stage or point of no return if you have mutations and we call that also a classic Stargardt group that <clears throat> develop into this stage, then you develop the disease further. However, as I said, if you have 1961 or you have a very hypomorphic uh, variants in ABC4, you will not get to this transitional stage at all and you pretty much stay in this uh, stage, first three stages as we classify it until the uh, end of your life. So one thing what we are trying to figure out uh, and uh, we know that right now a lot of discussions are about precision medicine or precision 
ophthalmology is uh, genetically it means we have to figure out all variation in patients that cause uh, a specific phenotype because then you can advise the patient uh, in terms of progression of the disease and in terms of uh, possibly available um, treatment uh, options. So I will talk about that at lunch quite a bit more, but here I'll just show a, uh, one interesting example that we very recently published. Again, uh, we had a uh, proband that had a pretty uh, 19 years old female uh, and had an early onset uh, vision loss. At 19, she was 20, 50 and had younger sister with quite uh, similar symptoms as it always uh, happens if they're affected. So this is the proband. So this is the short wavelength autofluorescence. It has pretty uh, elevated lipofusin accumulation. Again, has the bullseye phenotype. And as you can see, has also the optical gap on uh, the uh, OCT images. So, uh, again, most of these kind of cases are clinically diagnosed as Stargardt disease, and uh, we screen them for mutations. Uh, however, there are some other diseases that can give very similar clinical presentations, occult macular dystrophy caused by mutations in RP1L1, uh, which is usually dominant disease with very variable penetrance depending age of onset is different. Achromatopsia, again, that is caused by mutations in a slew of different genes, but is mostly characterized by color blindness, uh, what uh, Stargardt disease is not. So the, we, uh, as I said, automatically always screen similar patients for uh, mutations in ABCA4. And uh, again, in this case, as expected now, we find that she is carrying one 1961 mutation. Therefore, uh, the uh, optical gap and the uh, bullseye phenotype. The other variant is also a very well-known mutation in ABCA4 gene. And when we were looking at the family, the sister showed quite similar phenotype, and the mutations segregated with the disease in the family. Both sisters were compound heterozygous for these. One mutation came from mom, the other from the father. Uh, and the brother uh, was lucky to have no mutations in ABC4. Now, in the follow-up exam, the disease was quite stable. As expected, I mean, there was progression. The optical gap was uh, getting uh, larger. But uh, one other thing, what we noticed with this patient specifically with the white field autofluorescence was this interesting kind of mud splatter uh, phenotype on the uh, periphery. So uh, this is the proband imaged from almost all angles, and again, this is a quite specific phenotype that is not associated with ABCA4. Um, so, uh, but there are patients that present with this phenotype, and this disease is called X-linked ocular albinism, and you have this <coughs> mud splatter type uh, <coughs> Uh, retinal appearance. Um, so this is a phenotype with carriers, females, and they have uh, the disease is caused by mutations in GPR 143 gene. Um, so this has been described, the phenotype has been described, um, and um, there are many papers that talk about ocular albinism. Now in this family, the healthy brother was absolutely fine. But affected sisters had this additional phenotype feature. So this is, again, uh, to put these disease phenotypes in perspective, this is a carrier of uh, X-linked um, ocular albinism, and these are the affected's 
from this family. And we, of course, since we had that good lead, did sequence the gene, and we found that there was a disease-associated variant in both affected sisters, not in the brother, not in the mother, but also in the father. Now, as many diseases go, there is the non-penetrance issue because the father should have been really affected. This is a pretty severe mutation, tyrosine to uh, cysteine. But father showed extremely minimal signs, so he had no vision loss symptoms, but there were, if you look very carefully, some signs. So you can uh, call this case a reduced penetrance that, that you see a lot in retinal disease, in many well-known diseases such as Best disease, uh, where you have uh, sometimes very severe phenotype in kids, but their parents are absolutely fine uh, visually, although best disease is mostly also dominant disease, like um, in this case. So this is the mutation. It is a new variant in that uh, uh, gene. It is a highly conserved area, and uh, it is predicted to be deleterious by all programs. So it is definitely this variant that causes this uh, mod splatter phenotype in this patient. However, interestingly, you don't see that uh, pattern in the macular area. Uh, and the reason is simple. You have accumulation of some lipofusin, so it kind of masks that uh, phenotype in the macular area. And so this is kind of the summary of uh, the work where uh, two sisters were found to be affected with really uh, uh, Stargardt disease, but were also carriers for uh, the uh, mutation in GPR-143. <clears throat> the mother was just a carrier for a mutation in ABC4, and the father was very mildly expressing uh, the disease um, that should be uh, the ocular albinism uh, phenotype. So to summarize uh, some of this, what I said, so the optical gap phenotype that I mentioned is uh, seen in quite a number of Stargardt patients, and it is associated with the 1961 mutation. The mutation really doesn't matter what you have on the other allele. It can be a very severe mutation, can be very mild mutation. The phenotype you get is pretty much always the same. The disease is kind of arrest, uh, arrested in this first uh, few disease groups and has bullseye phenotype, no lipofusin, and so on. It is very difficult to make any correlations, uh, except maybe with 1961, and we have now a few more examples with the disease severity. Yes, if you are a knockout, you are likely to develop early onset very severe disease and have quick progression either to cone rod or the RP-like phenotypes. And a big problem <coughs> with Stargardt disease and clinical trials for Stargardt disease is that disease is not very rapid, so doing clinical trials is pretty tough. So you really have to select a very specific group of patients where you can measure some quantifiable features. Because uh, one of the features, I don't know if I have it here, probably not. So one of the features is, of course, the expansion of the geographic atrophy. Uh, in many patients, such as 1961, it expands very, very slowly. So you don't see much difference in a year or two. And of course, nobody wants to do or even uh, will fund the clinical trials, uh, which go five years or uh, longer. So you have to really classify the patients, you have to know the genotype, and then you can select a group of patients that can reasonably be measured in terms of quantifiable differences uh, within uh, two years. So again, mutations in ABC4 cause very many different phenotypes, variation in the gene, and the genomic locus is really vast. I'll talk about that at lunch. Uh, we know more than 1,000 mutations, individual mutations that are causing the disease. Uh, the most frequent is in 20%, but most of them are very, very rare in individual cases. 
And another interesting thing is that we are working on now is that even with a comprehensive screening of the entire locus, and this means the genomic locus, you screen the coding regions, non-coding and everything, you still have many cases that uh, show only one mutation, but they definitely look like they have ABC4 disease, and we're trying to figure that out, and I'll discuss that also a bit more during my genetics talk. So uh, this is another issue here, is that 1 in 20 people carry one pathogenic ABC4 mutation. The carrier frequency is really high. Not all combinations, though, cause the disease. So, because if you do the straight calculations, you would uh, see that the Sargar disease would be really highly prevalent. It is much more prevalent than it has been stated. It has been stated like 1 in 10,000. My guess is it's at least two, three times more frequent because a lot of people, as you saw, are not uh, clinically diagnosed as Stargard patients because they look very different. And the other problem is that right now the clinical trials that are ongoing say that the inclusion criterion is at least one mutation because of this high carrier frequency and uh, wide heterogeneity in uh, genetic and clinical presentation. This is really not a good criterion. You have to have uh, two mutations in order to have a definitive uh, diagnosis of the disease. Okay, so this is the quiz that usually comes with clinical presentations. So one row is ABC4 disease. The other row is not. So who are the retinal specialists here? And tell me, you know, which, which is which. And this again shows how difficult it is clinically to diagnose the disease. Any guesses? So the bottom row is confirmed ABC4 disease with different mutations, severe disease, milder, and again this is a homozygous 1961 patients. And these patients have mutations in RDS periphery. Um, <clears throat> that usually the disease uh, mutations cause in PRPH2 is called pattern dystrophy, but they are very often very much alike. So you really have to screen all genes. Actually, the case in the middle, well, actually this case, is a person who works at Columbia, and she was always asking me to figure out so what disease she has. We had screened ABC4. We didn't see anything. And only when we started doing the whole exome sequences, so we quickly figured out the disease, uh, so that this is really a dominant um, a pattern dystrophy, what is uh, clinically. This is mutations in CRX. Again, this looks very unusual for CRX disease. So it looks very much like the bullseye we have uh, with the 1961 mutation in ABC4. But again, this is another way <clears throat> the precision medicine is currently developing is that, again, only after you know the specific variants in specific genes you can call the disease. And what is also called phenotypic expansions, we see because CRX uh, mutations cause dominant early onset retinitis pigmentosa, so this is very unusual phenotype for CRX. It's a bullseye, and as you see, the mutation is actually a stop codon, so it's a severe mutation. So this is the CRX family we had. This is a pretty large family, so all affected, except the grandmother, and I always say that sometimes old ladies are really tough. She didn't have the disease. Uh, the, all the others, uh, kids, uh, even grandkids, who we were able to screen had the disease. We even got a cell paper out of this. Actually, no, we were on the cell paper. And that was actually a very interesting paper out of uh, Baylor where they were doing the mutagenesis in Drosophila and looking at uh, matchings in uh, the phenotype in the flies to the human phenotypes. And this was one of the genes that came up. And so we had uh, this specific family. With this work, it was, it was fantastic to learn that the method 
I mean, after they do the chemical mutagenesis, the method they look for the mutated flies is ERG. So actually, they do ERGs on thousands of flies. And you know, when, when our ERG uh, group is complaining that they can do four people per day, I say, well, these guys did it on the flies, and they did hundreds quickly. So, but this is, yeah, the example of uh, the CRX. Um, this, again, is just the same slide, and I pointed out to this patient, and this was the uh, family that I mentioned at Columbia. So, again, the sisters that we saw, and their mother, who was at very advanced age, uh, where all had different clinical diagnoses. Yeah, mother, of course, had AMD because she was well into her 90s. Uh, and uh, the sisters, yeah, one of them was diagnosed with Stargardt, the other with macular degeneration. But it turned out that it is really not ABC4, not Stargardt, but it is pattern dystrophy. And there is a deletion that causes this other variant is just a benign variant that is on the same allele, on the same haplotype with the deletion. And I think this is pretty much all I have today. So again, a take-home message. Uh, not all ABCA4 diseases, not all Stargardts are caused by mutations in ABCA4. Oftentimes they are very much look like Stargardt, but there are other genes that are involved. And oftentimes, even if they are uh, confirmed to carry one allele, they still uh, do not have ABCA4 disease. And the reverse, as I showed, is also true. We have found uh, many cases where the phenotype does not uh, look like ABC4 disease, but is definitely caused by ABC4 uh, mutations. The disease is extremely heterogeneous. The gene is very heterogeneous, and you really have to use a many different methods. Nowadays, we pretty much resort to whole exome sequencing, uh, although we still do sequence ABC4 uh, first if there is a good diagnosis of Stargard disease because it is a quick and these days quite a cheap way of analyzing. And then if we are not finding two allelic mutations in ABC4, we find one or none. And I'll talk about that also at lunchtime. We put them through the whole exome sequencing. And we do find the cause of the disease at a very high percentage. I would say close to 80% we find uh, when we screen a case with retinal disease by whole exome sequencing. Again, very important is to collect all family and family members because doing analysis of whole exome sequencing on sporadic cases is very difficult unless you really hit something that is very well known. You really have to collect at least one parent if possible and siblings whether they are affected or not because then your power of the genetic analysis is really quite uh, substantial. And when I talk to other geneticists about you know, other diseases, immune diseases, their success rate is about 50, 60 percent. I think in eye diseases, since we really have researched them quite a bit, uh, in terms of retinal disease, we know I think it's approaching 250 genes that are causal in different retinal diseases, sometimes uh, simple eye diseases, sometimes mm, they are syndromic diseases. I'll talk about that also at lunch. So uh, this is uh, what I always stress, although even these days when I lecture to residents, they say, okay, genetics is probably necessary evil. I think in Utah, you know, think differently, but at Columbia they say, okay, let's get through with it. I say, well, this is the only way to do uh, clinical research because you have to collaborate with geneticists in order to really precisely diagnose your patients. So that's it. Thank you very much for the pleasure. Some of our uh, retinal people had to stay for an Arvo meeting after the academy, so I hope.
Paul wanted to... Well, I'll meet with Paul tomorrow morning. Yeah, I, yeah so he, yeah. he's out now, Emmy and several others are not. Uh, so, as you know, I mean, uh, a lot of our approach diseases came from the German morphologists, and so essentially they're saying we're calling disease because it looks alike, and that's when we came up with these different categories. And uh, then as we started getting genetic basis, the hope was, is, okay, we get the exact genetic, then the phenotype will be very specific. So now it's getting confusing for physicians because what we're finding out, now you can have the same genetic defect, but you can have quite variable phenotypic presentation. So as you can imagine, it's a, we're right kind of think in the middle <laughs> of an area of determining, you know, which way we are. I think we're still largely as clinicians, morphologists, getting the genetics, and I think eventually it's going to get way more to personalized medicine where we're saying genetics is where the action is. And we have to realize that the phenotype may not be telling us you know, much about the actual cause. What are your, your thoughts about that? And that's just no, this is absolutely correct. And this is what I try to stress, and I will talk about that more. That on, sometimes I title my talks like simple and complex ABC for disease, yeah, because uh, it is a Mendelian disease, so th therefore it is simple, because you have to have two mutations, you get the phenotype. However, the more we learn, both with the, the new clinical methods, yeah, this advanced imaging, when you can really image retina in a fantastic way, and with genetics, yeah, with all the sequencing, so it gets, again, more complicated, because it's not always, and ABC4 is a good example, because it's not simple. Yes. What I say is that for diagnosis of a Mendelian disease, uh, sequencing is a must, yeah? because if you have two mutations, you have the disease. At least you can tell the patient, let's say there is a uh, clinical trial coming up, uh, gene therapy. Yeah? So you have to know the right. gene in order to do that. And uh, even here, when I was talking about, uh, let's say, the therapeutic applications at Columbia right now, we have one guy who's uh, feeding patients with deuteriated vitamin A. And so the idea is that deuteriated vitamin A will make A2E at a much slower rate. Yeah? So he's attacking that A2E part, that to eliminate the formation. Now, as I showed, let's say 25%, at least maybe one third, of patients with ABCA4 disease do not accumulate lipofusin. Yeah? So that doesn't make sense really to go there even if it's safe, although eating deuterium vitamin A all your life is maybe another <laughs> kind of thing you are not, although it has been shown to be safe and, you know, at least short term, but, you know. So th this is exactly the case, yeah? So we have to, you know, put much more work in uh, the dogma or the premise of personalized medicine is great, but we are far away from it yeah? because you know, we all learn about this great variety because we all have, uh, even if you're closely related to somebody, you know, hundreds of variants that are different from that person. And what they do and how they interact is quite difficult to say. No, what I suggest always is to keep it simple because when we do whole exome sequencing, of course, you see a lot of stuff. So I say keep it to the eye. Yeah, so. If the patient comes in with Stargardt, look for ABC4 first. Look for genes that are known and could be known, and I'll show that again in my second talk. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you start looking at everything, you'll see too many things. And all these suggestions, you know, the 23andMe and other companies that screen you for a couple hundred bucks and give you, you know, your life story is nonsense, yeah? because you don't want that. Because you can often get a lot of wrong information. And we know that, let's say, in A and D that we do. Yeah? You have these variants in factor H, you, in the other genes that are definitely linked. But sometimes they cause it and sometimes they don't. Yeah? So you have to be quite uh, uh, careful with that. So yes, there, it's kind of a, the advancement. And in genetics, it's, I really call it the revolution, you know, the way we can sequence now, yeah, yeah. because the last five years. So, the advancement I mean, is a blessing, but it's also a curse, because so things get even more complicated. complicated. But you really have to kind of work on both ends, on clinical morphology yeah, and, and so genetics to really kind of make sense of, of all of that. Exactly. And we see many, many more cases, yeah, like I showed, where you have two genes, yeah, Mendeley, involved, and, you know, you see bits and pieces of each phenotype. 
Uh, but yeah, we're far from diagnosing it very well uh, at this point. But well, the short answer is no. The longer answer is no. Yeah, yeah. We just now know it's not as simple as if you have. The big answer is, is, it, is does Eretz two appear necessarily do anything and all those? That's right. I think that there was a hope. Yeah. No, it is not the case. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, here, here's the whole. It's not the case thing. because you, you have. Yeah. That, you, know, Greg said, yeah, you have to know that yeah, because there is a lot of um, you know this uh, incomplete penetrance cases, and you see that a lot. Yeah, when, especially when you work on the families, and what I always say and here, I think <laughs> the best place to work on the families. I mean, you see the mutation going yeah, through the pedigree, but you know some people have early, very severe disease. Some people have practically so nothing, definitely no vision loss, and that does confuse yeah, and, uh, the analysis. Uh, but uh, we're, we're in that, that mix um, right now, where we're kind of halfway between these areas, and so we need to understand it. But uh, uh, this, and, and in the academic cannabis position, it's not important to me. Very short-sighted, uh, but it's going to be changing quite rapidly yeah. as, as, as this moves along. And, and we're now uh, digging into more and more of these different diseases and discovering that a lot of this is incredibly complex. But complex doesn't mean it's impossible to cite through. It just means it's complex. And uh, I think this is the this is the golden era. But the, it's this kind of thing is just. Randall gave a perfect example of the thought we have. If you get this specific genotype, you're going to get this phenotype. Very specific to which is what the morphologist had always figured. Just is not going to be the case. It's just not going to be that. And yeah, the short answer is no. So there's here. Here's the whole the whole thing. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Greg Haven sitting here, and that's the big one that drives him crazy. Is that we're, we're getting treatment now for macular degeneration, and uh, uh, we're just calling it morphologically. And then we're treating it, but let's say we're treating complement factor H. Well, we know there's lots of macular degeneration cases that are very severe. They have no complement factor H abnormality. It's not going to do anything. And so then we're surprised that we have a failure associated with it. And uh, uh, we, we're, we're in that, that mix right now where we're kind of halfway between these areas and, and we need to understand it. But uh, uh, the, and, and in the academic cannabis position, it's, it's not important you know, that we're and a very short-sighted, uh, but it's going to be changing quite rapidly, obviously, as, as this moves along. And, and we're now uh, digging into more and more of these different diseases and discovering that a lot of this is incredibly complex. But complex doesn't mean it's impossible to cite, it just means it's complex. And uh, I think this is the this is the golden era, but it's this kind of thing is, is Randall gave a perfect example of the thought we have. If you get this specific genotype, then you're going to get this phenotype, and it's going to be very specific, which is what the morphologist had always figured, just is not going to be the case. It's just not going to be that thing. Yeah, in terms of treating of Stargardt, yeah, genetic screening, of course. I think that um, now we have, since I am at Columbia, an in house genetic screening, but there are many uh, CLIA certified laboratories that screen right now and actually do whole exome sequencing straight. For, and oftentimes it is covered by the insurance, yeah, so that's another issue that is not always the case, and it is not uh, cheap, because it's four or five thousand, I, I think, to do you know a, a comprehensive yeah, screening. But you know it is covered. So I would certainly do. In terms of how to treat Stargard, yeah, that's a good question. I, as I said, we did the gene therapy, yeah. So this is putting the working gene in, and uh, theoretically for recessive diseases, this should be the cure. But you, of course, have to do it at the right time when you still have, you know, cells left there yeah, to where to put it in. Clinical trials are ongoing, but phase one, as you know, is always, you know, hopeless cases. Yeah, so they took people that, you know, they, there is no cells to put it in, and they, but it's safe. They showed. So we'll see. Now I hear that it is not done at Columbia. Now I hear they have the, uh, uh, they have allowed to go into children or at least younger people. So we'll see. Chemical modification I mentioned, yeah, so some people are trying to target that thing, but I said this is not a very universal feature of the disease, although it's the most prominent feature, the E2E accumulation, it's still not in 100%. Then a uh, very simple thing, what I always tell patients is that, you know, avoid light as much as possible because 
the more visual cycle works, yeah, so the more disease you get. There have been some extreme suggestions, let's say the uh, eye patches and, you know, you kind of close one eye so you keep it, you know, not <laughs> damaged and then, you know. Uh, before it was known that, or thought, and actually this was a paper published by Gabe Travis and group that uh, in the dark, the mice, the mouse model of Stargardt did not accumulate lipofusin. That was wrong. It actually does. So now we know that the darkness is really not a cure. I mean, it's a difficult suggestion anyway, but I usually say that, you know, try to limit yeah, the exposure to light. And the other thing is obvious vitamin A. Just avoid vitamin A as much as possible. And this is, again, a very uh, controversial statement, yeah, because vitamin A is good for vision. Everybody says, you know, you have to have it. In some diseases, it is true that you have here. The problem is that it is not removed yeah, fast enough. So the thing is, it accumulates. And that is the cause of the disease. So as little as possible vitamin A. Yeah? So you, you shouldn't go too crazy. But uh, you know, if you avoid vitamin A in diet, that's enough. However, I've seen many, many cases, and, and people have asked me that, oh, my eye doctor prescribed me you know, 15,000 units per day. And I said, yeah, you'll go blind fast. So if you don't stop it now. And then they sometimes argue that, and especially the doctors, that Alec Metz is a geneticist. He's not a doctor. He doesn't know anything. So. But this is one thing that you oh, can... Mexican with RT. <laughs> yeah, so that is uh, the RP vitamin A is good for some forms of RP. But that was, yeah, when, when this came out, I even wrote a letter to when any I put out that thing that, you know, eat vitamin A. I put out, a, I sent a letter to Seeming and, you know, I said, guys, don't... St they did not uh, publish it. <laughs> I think they kind of modified a little bit of their statement, but yeah, this is the old Elliot Burson thing, yeah, that you eat, yeah, you eat yeah. uh, vitamin A and cure Very it. controversial. It is, and here you know, we know functionally why it's bad, yeah? So actually you shouldn't do it, you know, you shouldn't do it and you should avoid it uh, rather than take uh, any kind of a supplement. So there is a, but many diseases, yeah, it is a, we had a case that I will, Discuss today where you have mutation in another gene in the visual cycle there. Uh, Chris Balshevsky and other smart guys said eat vitamin A. Yeah? So there you should do it because that is a, it depends really where the defect is. Yeah, so. Greg. So, so Rando, the flex, are they patches of dead RPE or are they, or are they RPE cells that have just lost melanin and are packed with microtubes? Actually, Right now, Janet says that they are photoreceptors and not even RPE. Any thinking about why they're all about the same size? Well, it is, uh, yeah, that's a good question because now this is the paper. No, this is not the, uh, the paper I'm talking about. This is just a method paper. But we recently uh, came out, Janet, I think, is the first author there. So there is a bit of a discussion here, and, and, and quite a lot of um, uh, animated discussion, I would say, because always the theory, and Janet Sparrow was the one to say, see you later, was the, that the cause of the, although the defect is in photoreceptor, yeah, uh, but what happens is that uh, retinoids, all trans 11 cysts accumulate, form A to E, uh, photoreceptor is, uh, phagocytosed, and then in the RP, the lipofusin accumulates, photoactivates, lysis cells, RP dies first, photoreceptor go after. Uh, right now, people are stating that actually the death of photoreceptor in some cases occurs first. And this is true with this optical gap that I showed, you know, with 1961 mutation. And this method allows to kind of disassociate yeah, RPE from the photoreceptor. And so what Janet is saying, for example, here, yeah, so if you overlay these two, these are dead RPE cells, yeah, so the black. But there is heavy fleck on that same spot. What she's saying that, yes, there were a few things 
Some said that there are RPE cells that are, you know, engorged of lipofuse, and then there was this uh, discussion that on the edge here, you have them kind of overlaying, and that's why it's more intense. Now, the statement is that this is really photoreceptors that give those fleck uh, patterns. Why it is such a uh, structure, it's difficult to say. Well, it's so typical of a lot of these dystrophies, right? These yeah. Catchy things that are about three yeah. to 400 microns yeah. in yeah. Because now here, again, yeah, this is this discussion that I'm pushing the wrong button that, you know, you have lipofusin fleck after the RPE is dead. Yeah? You don't see it before. So I think it was it the, you know, a year or a few years later was this image done yeah, from the same patient. So that's kind of one of these arguments that what actually you see flex, it's not RPE as much as it is photoreceptors full of lipofusin. Okay. Mm -hmm.